Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Last week, we found out that two high-profile members of SpaceX's fleet are leaving for new opportunities. Over the last couple of years, Ms. Tree and Ms. Chief have been working on fairing recovery, using their massive nets to try to catch the fairings discarded by rockets. Now, these fairings are flying vehicles in their own right, with control systems, navigation, reaction control thrusters, and steerable parafoils that allow them to navigate through re-entry and down to a gentle touchdown on the ocean. Now, the fairings cost millions of dollars each, and when I was at SpaceX's factory, you could see that the uh, fairing manufacturer just took a huge section of the factory floor on its own, so I can see why recovery was justified. So both ships had made successful catches in their career using the massive nets, but the experience hasn't all been good, and many more of the fairings have been recovered after a soft landing in the water. Perhaps more importantly, there have been a few incidents where things went really wrong. Sometimes the fairings hit the net, but then were pulled off and damaged as the parafoils failed to separate. And after some rough seas, we've seen ships come back uh, with damaged nets or even missing arms just due to the problems of navigating such unwieldy vessels on the high seas. But I think perhaps most importantly, the fairings recovered from the water have been reflown successfully without any issues that we know of. I mean, beyond losing the sound dampening panels that are used to protect sensitive payloads. So while SpaceX initially had high hopes for flawless fairing recovery, they've now had enough experience and got enough data to show that the benefit of a dry fairing recovery isn't worth the extra costs and risks associated with it. And also, with the majority of SpaceX flights being Starlink launches, there's no extra effort needed to convince the customer that a reflown fairing is completely, completely free of salt water. So, Miss Chief and Miss Tree are leaving the SpaceX fleet. They've been stripped of their giant nets and other special equipment. And as they left the harbor, we saw, you know, the classic Navy salute or Marine salute, I don't know, spraying water at the back as they set their course for Louisiana for new jobs. It's important to note that they are leaving the SpaceX fleet but they weren't really owned and operated directly by SpaceX. I believe um, these vessels are like Seacore Marine and Juice Oceanic. I don't know. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's fearing recovery is still going to happen, but instead of you know, landing on a ship by carefully matching the course and hitting the net, they're going to land gently in the water where they will be, a ship will rendezvous with them and recover them. And this new ship, ship that was assigned for the latest launch is the Sheila Bordelon, operated by Bordelon Marine. And it's described as an ultra light intervention vessel. It's mainly been working in the offshore oil business and it can use, they talk about how it can use remotely operated vehicles to perform work up to three kilometers underwater. And it has a crane able to go that deep. I don't think they're recovering any fairings from underwater, but point is that's what it's been designed for. So yeah, this ship has been practicing fairing recovery off the coast for the last few weeks and Wednesday's Starlink launch number 23 was its first attempt to do it for real and a day later it returned to port with a fairing half on its deck. So I'm presuming at this point that they do have enough data to know that it's worth their time and effort uh, if it wasn't, they could just build the fairings without any of the extra recovery gear and that would make them lighter and save money. Uh, I'm not sure we'll see any other space launch providers investing in fairing recovery based on SpaceX's experience, even although we are seeing some other launch providers really starting to take steps towards booster recovery. So anyway, while we're on the subject of SpaceX's Navy, it's worth talking about the rest of their fleet. The company actually has a substantial number of marine vessels that they use for its operations. Uh, they have ships for the recovery of the Dragon capsules, the fairings, we, they have the drone ships for recovering the boosters, and of course they have tugs and support ships that are used to move the uh, barges and uh, support them. And now, if you're really interested in all the comings and goings of SpaceX's wet fleet, then I'm going to say Gavin Cornwell, he runs the SpaceXFleet.com and he has a Patreon. Uh, he's been tracking all these operations in far more detail than I could ever manage. 
So actually, let's talk about them. First, we're going to start with the drone ships, the gigantic landing pads that sit in the middle of the ocean and provide a safe place for the boosters to touch down after their flight to space. These are referred to by the acronym ASDIS, Autonomous Spaceport Drone Ship. While they might look like dumb barges towed by truck uh, tugs, they've got their own onboard propulsion that keeps them in place against the forces of oceanic currents and weather. During the landing operations, they can hold their position to within about three meters. So there's three of them, uh, all of them with names very much inspired by the work of Scottish sci-fi author Ian M. Banks. There's, of course, I Still Love You, which has been the primary East Coast ocean landing site. There's Just Read the Instructions, which started as a West Coast landing ship, but was then moved to the East Coast to support the more rapid launch cadence in the last couple of years. And finally, still under construction, there is a shortfall of Gravitas, and that will be used to restore Astis' recovery option for, from uh, Vandenberg. So they were all constructed in Louisiana. And to get to the West Coast, incidentally, the just read the instructions had to go through the Panama Canal. But it's actually too wide in its final configuration. So the landing pad extensions, the wings like along the side, those were built, but they weren't loaded onto the deck of just read the instructions so it could navigate the canal. And once on the West Coast, the pad extensions were lifted off and then welded on there to match the final configuration. And that meant for the return trip, they had to cut these off again, put them on the deck, travel through the canal, and then reattach them on the East Coast. So uh, also, by the way, just read the instructions. It's the second SpaceX drone ship with this name. There was a, an earlier one that was used for landing attempts in 2015 when they were still working on the problem. And I guess that some lessons they might have learned during this resulted in changes to, of course, I still love you. And that would actually be the first drone ship to be used and to recover a booster. I think they probably just scrapped the original Just Read the Instructions, and the current one follows the design of Of Course I Still Love You. And I'm going to say that as a fan of Ian M. Banks, those names never get old. I was delighted to see um, Richard Garriott going to the bottom of the ocean, and there were ships called The Limiting Factor. It was fabulous. So anyway, while those drone ships have uh, their own propulsion with the azimuth thrusters to hold position, they don't actually travel long distances under their own power. Instead, they're towed to the landing sites by tugs. And there's quite a few different tugs that they've used over the years. And I think there's nothing special about these. There's uh, currently the Hawk, the Finn Falgut, Lauren Foss, the Hollywood. They don't have anything special about them, but they can be used to move these things around. So... The drone ships also have a support ship assigned to them for operations. And these are, the vessels actually have the crew on them and they'll have communications equipment and other special you know, gear that's needed to help with the recovery. Now, this has usually been the Go Quest on the East Coast. And uh, on the few drone ship recoveries on the West Coast, it's been the NRC Quest. And these are operated by different operators, right? Go, I think, is Juice Offshore with a, a G, and NRC is National Response Corporation. More importantly, though, NRC Quest, which was operated on the West Coast, it was the primary recover vessel for all the Dragon 1 capsules, which, yeah, they landed in the Pacific and they would be picked up put on the deck and the ship would return to port as quickly as possible so they could offload the science experiments from the ISS and hand it off to handlers on the ground. Now for Dragon 2, both crew and cargo vessels are intended to land on the east coast. And now that these might contain crew, there's actually a pair of recovery ships, so there's redundancy. There's Go Searcher and Go Navigator, and these are configured identically with the recovery crane and other support equipment, but they also have a helipad. And that's important if there's an emergency and they need to get crew back to shore quickly. So these two ships are also being used for fairing recovery in the past, but I imagine that that might be a short-term thing. Uh, really not clear, but that is a capability they have. In the last few months, of course, we've seen two of the biggest additions to the fleet with an eye on future offshore rocket operations of Starship. Phobos and Deimos, a pair of former oil drilling platforms apparently acquired at a bargain basement price as the demand for oil cratered in the last year. And these massive platforms were costing millions of dollars to upkeep so their owners were happy to get rid of them. I hear a platform of this size with all the equipment costs on the order of half 
half a billion dollars, and SpaceX managed to pick them up for less than 1% of this. Although I imagine that that might not include all of the equipment which might be returned to the uh, owner, or previous owner. So anyway, these are currently being stripped down to their structure, but given that the plan is to literally catch the boosters in the launch support hardware uh, and eliminate the need for landing legs, we can only really imagine what they might look like when they're finally done. Then again, plans change, so you know we'll have to basically see how things take shape over the coming year to get an idea how these end up looking. Finally, I think I need to give a shout out to the permanent crew members of the SpaceX Navy, an elusive group of characters who we rarely see. They practically live on the drone ships. These crew members go into danger to make sure that the still smoking boosters are secured quickly before the rest of the crew, who have much more sense of self-preservation, are allowed near. I'm of course talking about the octograbbers, which emerge from their uh, garages moments after boost landing. They roll under the rocket and then secure it in place so that there's no chance of the booster falling over in high seas. Uh, we've actually seen a few boosters lost after successful landings because octograbber either didn't exist at the time or wasn't able to help. Uh, I guess my favorite one, well, most interesting one, is the one of the Falcon Heavy cores, which landed safely, but there were subtle differences to the booster design, and that meant the Octograbber wasn't able to deploy to secure it, and the booster fell over on the way home. I, I mean, you know the saying, for every great booster, there's a great Octograbber securing them, or something like that. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe. Shh.